Okay. Uh -huh. Okay. Good evening and, and welcome to Turia Menendez. We are very honored to host uh, once more an event organized by the Aspen Institute and, and to have uh, Hugo Dixon and Jose Maria Darelza with us tonight. Uh, there are few more vital issues for Europeans these days than, than Brexit. Yesterday, uh, Prime Minister Theresa May said that 95% of the exit treaty was already agreed with the Irish border issue being the, the main outstanding question. At the same time, uh, Brexiteers uh, from her own party are questioning her leadership and thousands of people marched last weekend in London asking for a second referendum. Therefore, uh, all options are, are still uh, possible and this conference comes uh, at a critical moment. No? Uh, I will pass now the, the floor to Jose Maria Darelza, Secretary General of the Aspen Institute, to introduce our, our speaker, Hugo Dixon. Jose Maria. Eh? Thank you, Luis, and thank you, Uriah Menendez, uh, our trustee. And thank you all for coming. Thank you, Hugo, for coming back to Madrid. As uh, Luis has said, there's no better time than today at 7.38 p.m. to debate about whether Brexit can be stopped. Um, Europe is not just a political project. It's our oxygen. It's our civilization. And Britain will always uh, be a very important part of the European spirit. But we also want Britain uh, you know, to remain as close as possible to, to all of us, the rest of Europeans. Um, Hugo is many things. He's a dear friend. He's a leading journalist in the United Kingdom. He has worked in the Financial Times, The Economist. He started his own firm uh, for financial editorials, Breaking Views. Then uh, he was uh, working for a while um, at Reuters as a global board member. And then he went back to philosophy. You know, he had studied philosophy at Oxford, and, and he uh, retook his philosophy studies. I admire him because that's what I wanted to do um, when I was about to turn 50. But then I, I really got into Aspen Institute, where we try to help other people think philosophically. Uh, and, and now he's really devoted his time and, and his passion uh, to the political arena. He's become a brilliant uh, political strategist uh, as president of InFacts and also as vice deputy of the People's Vote Movement. Um, we're talking about why, you know, spend so much energy and take uh, the risk, right, of, of fighting uh, Brexit. And uh, he, he explained to me that it's about trying to promote the idea of, of courage in politics, of honesty, and of respect for others. And you know, those three ideals are at the heart of what we try to do in Aspen when we debate critically about the future of society and how we all as citizens should engage uh, in this quest. Hugo, I hope this is just one of many more visits to Madrid. Uh, I hope you, you feel at home here. And thank you so much for coming. The floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you. Um, sorry. Thank you, Jose, and uh, thank you, Luis. It's wonderful to be here in your fabulous auditorium and great to be back in Madrid. I do feel at home in Madrid when I am with friends like you. And I'm very pleased to be here today to talk about Brexit can be stopped, and here's how. And um, sometimes, uh, one of the things that actually Jose asked me this, this morning, he said, what did you want to be when you were a child? And I said, I don't remember it, but I was told that I wanted to be a priest. Um, I'm not 
very religious, but I love um, the Bible. And when you die, you go, if you're a good person, to heaven. And if you're bad, you go to hell. And if you're somewhere in between, you end up in purgatory. The same is true with Brexit. There are three solutions. There is hell, which is what Boris Johnson, our former foreign minister, who is the lead campaigner for Brexit, he wants us, which is crashing out of the EU with no deal at all. Then there is purgatory. This is what Theresa May wants. She wants us to be half in, half out, endless, on and on and on and on, not knowing what, where we are, one or the other. And then there is heaven. And heaven is what I am campaigning for, and I would like to convince you that it is possible. So, um, well, momentum is building for a people's vote. As uh, Jose said, we put on a march in London, 700,000 people on Saturday, just so we could have a fantastic event here today in Madrid. <laughs> but it's not just people power. There is a big chance of a deadlock in Parliament at the end of these Brexit talks. MPs do not want to crash out with no deal, but even if Theresa May gets a deal, she is going to struggle to push it through Parliament. The main opposition party, Labour, isn't fully backing a people's vote yet, but they have taken a big step towards it at their conference, their party conference, last um, month. And the EU, our friends in the rest of Europe, they need to factor in the possibility of no Brexit into their strategic thinking. So what is the people's vote? Well, the people's vote, we only started in April. I have been campaigning to stop Brexit virtually from the day of the referendum. I was campaigning before um, as well. But even on the day after, I said to my um, people, I said, let us not give up hope. There may be alternatives. It didn't look very hopeful in those days, but I never gave up hope completely. But we only created this new campaign, the People's Vote, in April. The key demand is that the people should have the final say on Brexit, and if they do not like what is on offer, they should have the right to stay in the EU. We're a coalition of non-parliamentary and parliamentary forces. We had this fantastic march. We have backing from trade unions, nurses, business, doctors, students, politicians, women's groups, LGBT groups, etc., etc. We have increasing support from the media. The Economist backs us, not fully, but partially, The Observer, The Independent, and other newspapers are increasingly giving attention to our campaign. And InFacts, which I um, am the chairman of, is one of the three core founders, and I am, as, as Jose said, I am the deputy chair of the overall People's Vote campaign. Now, not only did we get people on the street, but this is what the opinion polls show. So 45% want a people's vote, 34% don't. It doesn't sound like a big margin, but two years ago, it was only about 25% wanted a people's vote, so we've doubled that. One of the things that's driving things is this second thing. 68% think we will get a bad deal. Only 13% think we'll get a good de deal. But actually, sometimes in the office, we scratch our heads and we think, who are the 13% who think we're going to get a good deal? Um, and then this is where public opinion is on the big issue, 53% want to stay in the EU. That is a five-point swing since the referendum. Now, that is not, in my view, big enough. 
if we are going to win this campaign, we need to get that 53% into the mid to high 50s, so 56, 57. If we can achieve that over the next few months, I think we will win. It's quite interesting. Women, there's a much bigger swing among women than among men. We think that's because women are more open-minded and pragmatic. This is a gross generalization. Also, they are more worried about what Brexit might mean for them and their families. Particularly, we have a lot of EU citizens working in the UK looking after um, sick people in our health service and looking after elderly um, people at home. If we no longer have these people coming there, a lot of the women are wondering, who's going to look after the old people? And they're thinking, maybe it's going to be me, not my husband or my boyfriend who is going to be doing that. Um, and the other thing is that there's also a big swing among Labour supporters. So conservative, among conservatives, there's very little shift in opinion, but among Labour, there is a significant shift in opinion. And then, we, of course, we have young, young people. They were always very pro, but they're even more pro, and they're quite angry, and they're much more mobilized. In the referendum two years ago, the young people didn't vote nearly as much as the old people. If we have a people's vote, we think the turnout by the young will be extremely high. Um, so where are the talks? Well, she's going to struggle to get a deal. Uh, she had this idea, this so-called checkers idea, which is this purgatory half in, half out, in the single market for goods, but not in services, following EU rules, but without any vote on these rules. This is something she pushed through her cabinet in early July. She provoked resignations from Boris Johnson, among others. And then she put it to the EU leaders in Salzburg last month, and it was shot down. Then she made some more compromises, and she almost had a deal last week, but then it was shot down by her cabinet because, they did, because the key compromise that she was planning to make was for us to stay in the EU's customs union indefinitely. And then the other key compromise, and this is an important thing, which is the Irish question. In the referendum, um, there were some people, uh, including us at Infacts, but also two former prime ministers, Tony Blair and John Major, they went to Northern Ireland and they said, this is going to be a serious problem if the British people vote to leave the EU. It could seriously undermine the peace process in Northern Ireland. One of the reasons that there has been peace in Northern Ireland for 20 years is because Northern Ireland is part of the United Kingdom, but the United Kingdom is part of the EU. The Republic of Ireland is part of the EU, and so the divisions have been gradually massaged away. By coming out of the, the EU, this creates friction between the North and the South. It creates friction within Northern Ireland between those who want to unify with Ireland and those who want to be part of the UK, and it creates friction between Great Britain and Northern Ireland, because the sort of deal that she was going to do was going to mean there would be regulatory checks. So checks when goods cross from Great Britain into Northern Ireland to make sure that they um, uh, accorded with EU rules and regulations. And the DUP, which is a small party in Northern Ireland, but it's vital in the process because Theresa May does not have a majority she does not have a majority. The only way she has a majority is because of this party, the DUP. So because so she was close to a deal, but her cabinet, many members said no. The DUP said no. And at the last minute, she pulled back, which, of course, has damaged her credibility. Now, we have to expect that in a week or so, somehow the talks, which are currently at an impasse, will start again. Um, it's not clear that they can find a way through the thicket, 
But even, but even if she gets a deal, she's going to struggle to push it through Parliament. So we've got the Labour Party is going to vote against it. All of the opposition, apart from perhaps five or maximum ten MPs, will vote against it. Now, she will lose her majority. I've listed four different groups here. There are the Tory hardliners like Boris Johnson. There are the pro-Europeans who want to be either in the EU or very close to the EU, much closer than she's proposing. There is the DUP we've just um, spoken about. They've described this, this idea of checks in the sea as a blood red line. Now, when, you're, when this is coming from a party from Northern Ireland where there has been a lot of bloodshed, the term blood red line, well, it's quite serious rhetoric that people are talking about. And then there are the Scottish Tories. This is a new phenomenon. This is something people hadn't been thinking about. But the Scottish Tories are worried that if she does a deal that leads to differences between Northern Ireland and Great Britain, that could pave the way for a separation of Scotland from England. And so they're worried too. So she has a, her, her strategy seems to be to scare MPs and say, you've got to do my deal. You may not like it, but it's better than crashing out. Look, purgatory is better than hell. And purgatory is better than hell. But it's not a good argument if heaven is also an option. Now, hell. Um, she's saying... It's purgatory or hell. But hell, it's not going to be easy to get Parliament to vote for hell. The public doesn't want it. The Prime Minister doesn't want it. She says, she says, no deal is better than a bad deal. In our language, she says, hell is better than a really bad purgatory. Um, but she doesn't really believe that. Her cabinet doesn't believe it. The opposition doesn't want it. We think that there are only about, not even 10%, perhaps 5 to 8% of Tories, maybe 40 Tories in, in total, who would back, a, uh, uh, back leaving the EU with no deal at all. And just to put that in the context, because you've got fewer MPs than we do, we have 650 MPs in the UK. So I'm not saying that hell is impossible, but um, it will only happen by accident because of brinkmanship that has gone wrong rather than because it's something that people want. Now, there is another option, um, which you could say is a a different variety of purgatory, which is, um, Dante talked about the different levels of hell. I don't know if he talked about the different levels of purgatory. Somebody who's a, a Dante scholar can perhaps um, enlighten us. Um, but their favorite option is so-called Canada. Canada is the idea that we don't stay in even the single market for goods. It's an idea that we have a very deep free trade agreement with the EU after we leave. Um, the problem is that it's not very good for us economically, but the real killer is the third to last point. The EU will only agree Canada if the UK accepts the Irish backstop. And the backstop is this idea that under all circumstances, the Irish border, the land border between Northern Ireland and the Republic of Ireland must be kept open. Now, there's a problem, which is that if you want to close the borders between Great Britain and the EU, which you need to do if you're going to do Canada, and you want to keep the borders open, between Northern Ireland and the Republic of Ireland, which is required by the backstop, then you've got to close the borders between Great Britain and Northern Ireland. And that starts to divide the United Kingdom. 
So it doesn't look like that's a runner. And in the circumstances, it's like a process of elimination. The people's vote is the obvious solution. If MPs don't want any deal that she does, and they don't want to crash out either, and they can't come up with a better proposal, a people's vote will be the obvious way forward. And more and more MPs are backing us. It's not just the people on the streets. Labour. Now, I talked about Labour, and they have a slightly complicated position. But it's what I call the funnel. They're in the funnel. They're not yet down in the chute. They don't want the sort of deal that Theresa May is negotiating. They would like there to be a general election. They won't get a general election unless the Conservative Party is completely mad. And although there are some quite um, crazy elements within the Conservative Party, I don't think they are completely mad. They do not, the Labour Party, want to crash out with no deal. They do not want hell. And by a process of elimination, the only thing left for them will be a people's vote. So they're not there yet, but they have made an important um, step in that direction at their party. And most of their members and most of their voters are strong supporters of a people's vote. So it's just the leadership which is resistant. Now, the leadership, of course, in any political party is important. There are basically several ways you can get a people's vote. There, I've, I've given you four. If Theresa May gets a deal, MPs can reject it and call for a people's vote. Or Theresa May herself could say, you've rejected my deal. I'm going to ask the people to back me. Then there's two more, which are based on if Theresa May doesn't get a deal. Now, we put into legislation in the summer a trigger point of January the 21st. If there is no deal by January the 21st, Theresa May has to come to Parliament with a proposal. She can't just let the time click on and get us to March the 29th, which is when the UK is currently scheduled to leave the EU. So she has to face Parliament, and at that point, MPs can say there must be a people's vote. Or she herself could say, I want to leave the EU with no deal. I want to go to hell, but I don't want to be responsible for taking the whole country to hell with me unless they also agree to come with me. So this is also possible. Now, one thing that people sometimes ask, is there enough time? Well, before March the 29th. Now, Greece, um, which I know quite well, if you remember in 2015, they held a referendum, and they held it in eight days. Now, that was considered to be bad political practice, and we are not recommending an eight-day referendum in the UK. We think that there must be proper deliberation, the question must be properly set, the different um, sides of the debate must have adequate time and television, enough money, proper rules, etc., etc. The whole process is probably going to take about six months. So if we need to have a people's vote, we will need an extension to Article 50. Article 50 is the process under which we are leaving the EU, and we will need to ask the other 27 countries to give us some more time. Now, what some people say is they say, well, look, if you get your people's vote, will you win it? Why would it be any different than it was in 2016? Well, first of all, we are mobilizing public opinion. We have more passion than we did um, two years ago. Secondly, and this is really important, two years ago, it was the choice between the reality of being in the EU and the fantasy of Brexit. At the end of the process, it will be the choice between two realities. 
And as the reality becomes clearer and clearer, people are realizing that what they are being offered is not what they were promised two years ago. Now, we're not yet there, but in a couple of months' time, when there is a deal or when there is the prospect, when we know what purgatory looks like or when we know if we're heading to hell, then people, we think, public opinion will shift further. And then the other thing is this importance of positive messages. We had a bad referendum campaign two years ago. It was controlled by David Cameron. David Cameron was complacent. He thought that he would win easily. He had, until the last minute, he was trying to say, oh, I'm a Eurosceptic and maybe I don't really like the EU at all. So when he got into the campaign, it was extremely difficult for him to say anything good about Europe. But we are trying to learn the lessons. And yes, there are some things that are important and good. And the Queen um, once asked her dinner guests, she said, tell me three good things about being in the European Union. Well, I wish I had been at her table because I would have said what there are what I call the three P's. Peace, power, and prosperity. In all three areas, our interests are enhanced by being in the EU. I'm not trying to pretend that the EU is perfect. Any human creation is far from perfect. And if we stay in, we need to work together with our friends to improve it. But then the second thing we need to do is we need to address voters' legitimate concerns. A lot of people voted for Brexit because they were genuinely concerned about things in their lives. We didn't have as much austerity as you have had in Spain. Nothing like the same. However, we did have some of it. There has not been enough investment in our health service. There has not been enough investment in towns. The cities are doing quite well, but the towns have been neglected. And we have not done enough to integrate foreigners who come to our country. The British people were very concerned about migration. But the whole issue of migration from outside Europe and migration from inside Europe got muddled up, deliberately muddled up, by the Leave campaign. When you ask the British people, what are you concerned about when it comes to migration, there are two main things. One is they think, they think migrants do not pull their weight economically. The second is that they worry that migrants do not integrate properly and do not share our values. And the Home Secretary, who's a Pakistani of or, or, origin, Pakistani origin, he said the other day, and he is now backing Brexit, he said, in the future, we must insist that people who come to our country share our values. We must put an end to medieval practices like female genital mutilation, honor killings, and forced marriages. We must indeed put an end to these things. But I can tell you, these practices are not coming from Spain. They're not coming from France. They're not coming from Scandinavia. They're not coming from Germany. And when you talk about economic, the economic um, contribution of citizens coming to the UK, the government's own Migration Advisory Committee did some research which showed that the net contribution of European economic area citizens to our public purse is £4.7 billion a year. The net contribution of Brits is negative because we are running a deficit. And the net contribution of non-EEA migrants is quite large too. So the actual contribution of the Europeans to Britain, both culturally and economically, should not be a matter of um, concern. However, the issue has been completely and utterly muddled up. We need to address voters' legitimate concerns, but we need to show them that Brexit is not the answer. Actually, staying in the EU is part of the solution. 
So, I hope to have, I have message, messages, messages to you, our friends. The first is, heaven is possible. The second is, it's not just heaven for us. It's also heaven for you. We share similar values. We share similar interests. We are in the same part of the world. We are in the same broader European family. Geostrategically, we face the same challenges. We face the challenge of Putin in the East. We face the challenge of America, particularly under Donald Trump, disengaging from Europe, threatening the European alliance, the transatlantic alliance. We face the same challenges of North Africa, Middle East, West Asia, tens of millions of people on the move. We face the same challenge of the rise of China in the Far East. And we are stronger together. We will achieve more in the coming decades for ourselves and our children and our grandchildren if we work together. And the UK, you know, we are sometimes considered to be an awkward member of the European Union. We sometimes make life difficult and we haven't always been as cooperative as we should. And I accept that. But also, I think it's important to know that the grit in the oyster is what creates the pearl. And I think that... <laughs> so, when I say, when I say to, to our European friends and to you here in Spain, uh, in Madrid today, what can you do? The first thing is you should give us the best deal that you can consistent with your values and your interests. We're not asking you to do something that overturns your values, which are our values, which are European values, which are set there in Article 2 in the Treaty on the European Union. Democracy, freedom, rule of law, non-discrimination of the sexes, and so on and so forth. These are very important. We're not asking for that. I'm not asking for that. Some may be asking for that. You must stick to your values. You must stick to your interests. Don't punish us. No, don't punish us. But do give us the best deal that you can. But please, do not connive with the British government in any further dishonesty. There is a great risk that at the end of this process, there will be a two-part deal. The first part of the deal is the divorce, the withdrawal agreement. This will be very clear. It is a legally binding text. The second part will be a political declaration, which is a non-binding text. This will be sketching out what the future relationship will be. And there is a risk that this text will be written in such a way that it is deliberately intending to hide from the British people what the reality of Brexit means. There is a danger that there will be so much fudge that the Prime Minister will be able to say, look, I've got a fantastic deal, when she hasn't got a fantastic deal at all. And this would be what we are calling a blindfold Brexit. It would be a dishonest Brexit. It would be a betrayal of democracy, because without honesty, you cannot have a proper functioning democracy. And frankly, we have had too much dishonesty in this process already. Two years ago, we had a referendum that was polluted by lies and dishonesty. We must not pile one dishonesty on top of another dishonesty. And the other thing I ask you is that if we do decide that we want to hold a people's vote. We will need a bit more time. Don't make life difficult for us if we want some more time. If we want more time just to string on the talks endlessly getting nowhere, that's another matter. But if we want time to complete our democratic deliberations, don't make it difficult for us. 
And if, at the end of the process, we decide that we want to stay in the European family, I'm going to get back to my biblical analogies. Treat us as the father did in the Bible when the prodigal son, who had wasted the money on prostitutes in a foreign land, returns home. He didn't beat him. He didn't say, you've got to scrub and clean and crawl. He ran out to greet him and welcomed him back and killed a fatted calf. That, please, is the way that we want our friends here in Madrid, in Spain, and in the rest of Europe. Thank you very much. You don't have a, you didn't have a, a, a microphone, Jose. Okay. But I think Jose was saying, <laughs> ask your questions. And before you do that, just say your name. Thank you. Hello, thank you. Thank you so much for a very interesting conference. My name is Mercedes Stemburi, and I was wondering exactly what is people's vote? It's voting the conditions of the treaty again what is the difference with the referendum that happened two years ago? And, um, and uh, I haven't been uh, hearing, mentioning uh, any frontier with Gibraltar. I suppose it has never been uh, a deal in the, in the conversations. Okay, then there are those two questions. Spain and the UK actually did agree a, an interim deal on Gibraltar about a week ago but only for the interim. There is supposedly going to be a transition deal at the end of when we leave under Theresa May's plans. We go into purgatory for another two years and, or 21 months, or how, who knows? They're now debating maybe this needs to go on and on a bit longer. Um, so what the UK and the Spanish government have agreed is the arrangements that would, um, which, which would covered Gibraltar during that period. Gibraltar will come back on the agenda. When Theresa May says 95% has been agreed, 95% of the withdrawal agreement has been agreed, except for the 5%, which is the most difficult, the Irish question. And except for the future arrangement, where nothing has been agreed, including the future arrangement of Gibraltar. So if you, want, if you think that the future is arrangement is going to be about three times harder than the withdrawal agreement, you would say that it's about 22% has now been agreed. Um, what is a people's vote? It will be a referendum. It will offer people a choice between staying in the EU and, in our view, if there is a deal, because there may not be a deal, but assuming there is a deal, we think it should be a choice between the deal, leaving with the deal, and staying in the EU. So it should be a choice between purgatory and heaven. If there is no deal at all, purgatory is not on offer. And in that situation, we think it should be a choice between heaven and hell. There are some people... I should add, who say that if there is a deal, actually, the people should be offered a three-way choice, heaven, hell, or purgatory. Um, this is quite complicated. It's not what we are advocating. Ultimately, it will be up to Parliament to decide exactly what the question is and what is on the ballot paper. Um, but that's what we're pushing for. And it's different. The reason why it's different from 2016 is because then it was a choice between reality and fantasy. And you couldn't say it was hell or purgatory 
what the Brexit has said is, oh no, it's something even more wonderful. It's a super heaven, a supernova situation which we're going to take you into. But at the end of the process, there will be some reality. And the reality is already beginning to bite. It's not there quite yet, but it's really beginning to bite. Thank you. Um, excellent uh, presentation. A couple of questions about uh, the future. Is there a, a Could hard... Could you say your name, please? Yes, my name is Jose Cordeiro from the Millennium Project. And uh, is there a hard deadline? Because there are elections for the European Parliament on May 26. And then if uh, Britain uh, leaves the European Union, those uh, seats will be redistributed between the other European countries. And I believe Spain will get five extra seats. So, and this is happening. May 26 is the election. So, when can this be stopped? If so, and then what would happen to some of the MEPs from Britain, like uh, Dan uh, Hanna and um, Nigel Farage, that were campaigning against Britain, but they, uh, against uh, Europe, but they are very happy to keep their uh, their salaries, their permanent uh, salaries, which is what I don't know, 12,000 euros per uh, per month. Jubilation retirement. Well, there is, there, is, there is a certain hypocrisy there. Um, the European Parliament elections at the end of May are an important issue. Um, however, the European Council in, I think it was July, um, or maybe it was June, they passed, they, there was a little notice text that they approved which provided for uh, the seats, the UK's um, MEPs, not to be redistributed if the UK didn't leave the EU. There still is a question about what would happen in terms of the European Parliament elections um, and the timing of our referendum compared to the European Parliament elections there are about four or five different ideas about how to solve that problem. Ultimately, if we wanted more time, we would have to ask the European Council and also the European Parliament for their view about which of these four or five options was the best. Thank you. Daniel. Uh, th thanks very much for your presentation. It was very interesting. I'll, I'll be optimistic and I'll assume that there is a people's vote and uh, the UK uh, yes, makes Daniel it to heaven. Sarmiento from oh, I'm Daniel Sarmiento from Uria. Uh, let's just assume that the UK uh, returns to heaven. Well, it still is in heaven. Uh, and uh, as you said, the prodigal son is received in the terms that you described. My, my doubt is on the one hand, for the UK, what kind of UK the EU will be receiving back? Will it be a deeply divided country that's going to be haunted for years and years and years and maybe decades by the ghosts of Brexit? And how is that going to influence the UK's position in the EU? And on the other hand, the EU can be as happy and generous as it possibly can, but the EU, I'm afraid, that it's carrying on its own course, and I think that the EU's own course is the euro. Now, the euro is a very, uh, is a very complex experiment, but let's just assume that the euro survives for the next few decades. Uh, the dynamics of the euro for the members of the EU are such that it's very difficult, and it's going to be even more difficult in the following decades to be an EU member without being in the euro. And I think that for the UK, that was very much the case in the past few years, and particularly during the crisis, many of the reforms that were enacted in the EU, in, in, particularly in the context of the financial industry, they were basically just stuffed down the throat of the UK because we had to save the euro. That that kind of uh, dynamics will probably carry on in the future. It's going to be very difficult to be in the EU without being in the euro. And my, my, my impression is that the UK has no intention at all, even of staying in heaven, to be in the euro. So how would the UK manage that, thinking about the long term? Um, well, first of all, Daniel, I'm, I don't actually agree with your um, 
characterization of what happened with financial regulation. Um, there were, broadly speaking, two sets of things that happened. One was that there were regulations to, for the financial services industry, mainly banks, and, and, but other financial services companies. And those were pushed in throughout Europe, not primarily as a response to the Eurozone crisis. They were pushed as a response to the financial crisis, the credit crunch. And that was one that affected the UK deeply because we have such a big financial centre. And the UK was actually at the forefront of the G20 and other things like the Financial Stability Board um, that came up with those financial services regulations at a, initially at a G20 level, and then they were implemented. For example, capital adequacy was implemented in the EU um, in response to the financial crisis, not in response to the Eurozone crisis. Then there were, so we were not opposed to that at all. We were actually often pushing that. The second set of reforms were um, things to do with the euro, things like the, uh, the European stability mechanism, uh, bailout mechanisms, etc., etc. There was, at one point, uh, a rather inept attempt by David Cameron to stop the, um, the fiscal compact treaty, and that was very silly and totally unnecessary. Um, but it did not affect us. We were not involved in these bailouts. The only one that we were involved in was actually, to a small extent, in the bailout of Ireland. But that was not because we had to be. It was because we thought it was in our interest because there were a lot of British banks that were interconnected with Irish banks. And so I do think that the Eurozone will be a big preoccupation of the EU for the next decades. I'm not convinced, though, that there will be a rapid creation of a Eurozone government. I think that there is a huge amount of internal difficulty within the Eurozone between, let's say, the Latin and Southern countries and the Northern and Germanic countries. And uh, frankly, I think that the UK is best not being part of that internal debate and struggle. There are plenty of other useful things for the EU to do. There are two other big pillars. There is the economic pillar, the single market, and the trade policy. There is still a lot to be done on that. We all need to improve our productivity. And there's also the geostrategic pillar, which the UK has in the past not been that interested in. But as a result of the last two years, changes in the world, Putin, Trump, etc., but also as we begin to realize that it's cold outside on our own, we're beginning to realize, even Boris Johnson realized that we had more in common with Europe when it came to global warming or Iran nuclear pact than we did with Trump. And so... In the coming decades, I think the other big preoccupation of the EU is going to be the geostrategic one, and I think the UK has a lot to contribute in that dimension. A deeply divided country, it's true that we will be divided for some time to come, but it's very important, therefore, that in fighting a new referendum, a people's vote, that we make these positive messages, both sides of these positive messages. First, the advantages of being in the EU. But secondly, we really seriously address those concerns that led a lot of people to vote for Brexit in the first place. I think we can, but I, I, I can't promise that we will succeed. I think we can. I'm determined to do everything that I can to. And I think that if we fight a people's vote on that basis, we will get a good result. We won't just flip it from 52-48 to 48-52. We will get a convincing, clear margin between Remain 
and leave. And although there will be some people who will be unhappy, there will also be in the British public... You have to remember, most people, they didn't want this first referendum in the first place. It was a small, fanatical group who wanted it. It was not something that the general public wanted. The general public were concerned about jobs, the health service, austerity, homes, schools, training, watching the football match, going to a club at night. They weren't thinking all night long, oh my God, we've got to get out of the European Union. It was only a tiny group of people for whom this was an important concern. Thank you. Um, was there a question here in the first row? Yes. Hello, I'm Thomas from uh, Volt uh, Europe. I'm one of these uh, uh, enthusiastic uh, uh, young people that you spoke about. Um, I wanted to ask, uh, although for from my, for what I can imagine for, for Britain, it's in your very best interest to stay in the European Union, but for the European uh, Union as a whole, uh, seeing the problems that we already have, uh, this would be a great opportunity to to punish somebody, uh, send somebody to hell, and in that way solve other problems in, in Poland and other countries, uh, Greece, Italy soon. Uh, um, uh, there, there's much more that the European Union could use Brexit for uh, to its advantage. Although I've, I would like to see a unified Europe, and, and but as you mentioned, there would also be a very divided country then that would join back into the European Union, which has been dragging its feet for a long time, and, and we want to move forward because we have the euro that might fail, the union that as a whole is not functioning well. Um, yeah. Thomas, we're not going to hold the EU back on the euro if the EU wants to make further steps towards Eurozone government, Eurozone finance minister, Eurozone treasury, um, uh, deposit insurance schemes, whatever it is, if you want to do that, we will not stop that. Th there was, as I say, a cack-handed attempt by David Cameron in 2011 to do that. It was very silly, and he regretted it, and his... Finance Minister George Osborne made absolutely clear afterwards that we would do nothing of the sort. Um, honestly, you know, the Eurozone has been debating now for, I think, six years, something quite minor, a deposit insurance scheme. They haven't been able to agree on it. It's not because the UK has been stopping that. It's be because the Germans and the French can't agree roughly speaking, but it's, you know. You have to remember there are positive things for, of, of the UK. First, although we do ask difficult questions, we, and I hesitate to say this because it seems like we have been infected by ideology, but when we have got our senses, we tend to be fairly pragmatic and we look at situations, we look at what's going to work. And we may ask difficult questions, but we are looking at what will work. And actually, having a European Union that works is going to be a European Union that survives and thrives. We also contribute to Europe's economic strength. Now, I'm not trying to pretend that we are as strong as the rest of Europe, but we still, we are the second equal economy along with France. And this is an important, in a world of power blocks, being, having the UK in the EU increases the EU's power on the global stage. It also leads to a more competitive, dynamic internal market. There is the geostrategic value that the UK brings. We are, along with France, the only nuclear power in the UK. We have good armed forces. We don't always make the right strategic choices, but sometimes we do. We have good intelligence services. And there's another thing to say, which is populism. Brexit 
was a, the first, I mean, we have had displays. We had it in Greece. We had populism. We had the populism of the right followed by the populism of the left in Greece. And before that, we had Berlusconi in, in Italy was populism. But Brexit was the first really big demonstration of populism in Europe. We then had, in America, Trump's election. If the British people, looking at something, thinking about it carefully, making an informed choice, decide that they wish to stay in the EU, that is a much more powerful demonstration to the rest of the EU of the value of being in the EU. If, they, if people can say, look, even Great Britain, having looked at this, decided that they are better off in the European Union, that is a wonderful advertisement for Europe. And do not think that the best solution is to punish us. If, if you think the best solution is to punish us, actually, you'll make my job much harder <laughs> because the British people will not like the idea of being punished. But also be careful what that would do for the rest of Europe because Europe is, above all, it is a system of values. And the, one of the values is not punishment. You mentioned Greece. I covered the Greece, Greek crisis very closely. And there were times when it looked like other European countries, particularly Germany, was looking to punish Greece. This was not sensible. I think ultimately, Germany was not, you know, mas o menos, not unreasonable. But there were some moments when it looked unreasonable. And at those moments, that actually provoked waves of sympathy for Greece in other parts of the EU, including, bizarrely, in the UK. And I would say uh, the referendum that we had two years ago was a very narrow result if it had not been for the way that it looked like Greece was being punished, we probably would have won that referendum because there were actually quite a lot of people on the left in Britain who said, oh, the beastly Germans beating up on the Greeks, we can't be part of this. Um, and there were even some people on the right who didn't care a damn about Greece at all who said, oh, the beastly Germans beating up on the Greeks, not because they believe that, but just because they thought that was a useful whip to beat the EU with. So be very careful about thinking of punishing anybody, actually. Be fair. Be fair. That's the most important thing. But fairness is a two... Fairness is about balance. You must be fair to us, but not at the expense of being unfair to yourselves not at the expense, of course, of undoing the important single market, which, frankly, Britain did so much to create in the first place. Thank you. Uh, Il Alfonso. Il Alfonso Castro. Well, thank you for your refreshing presentation. It's something positive is good. That's one, if you allow me, uh, small advice. State the obvious. Heaven is better than hell. Always. <laughs> uh, I think that the main objective, the big picture, the main goal is safe private Britain. To because say what? Safe private Britain. Safe private Britain. Safe okay? private Britain. Because we will save Europe. Yes. But uh, the problem is, say, treat us, don't punish us. Treat us as the prodigal son. Okay, but please, no cherry picking, honesty, and don't play tactics. One of the reasons why Cameron, in my personal opinion, called the referendum, there are a few reasons, but one of the main reasons, because if you allow me out of his arrogance, he didn't think for a while that he could lose the referendum, was what I call Maggie's complex. Maggie had her money back and he wanted something back. So he, in my opinion, used the referendum as a negotiation chip to get a better status for Britain in the European, in the European Union. 
So I think we have to help you to remain. It's in our common interest, but please be honest. And two uh, questions, very, very quickly. One, uh, if you get the people's vote, you think that you will win the referendum in any case? And second, is I'm a proxy here because uh, a friend asked me to, request me to ask this question to you. How is going Trump's and Putin's alliance on Brexit? How is what? Uh, going Trump's and Putin's alliance on Brexit. How is their alliance? Yeah, an alliance, so to say. There are, Trump is, well, yes. let's say, happy, comfortable with Brexit. Yes, yes, uh, maybe yes, yes, yes. The yes. Russian guy is also happy. Thank you. <laughs> well, I mean, Lefonso, I would say, yes, we must be honest. I criticize Theresa May the whole time for not being honest. She says, she said um, at, at an important speech, she said, I'm going to be straight with the British people. And she then has not really been honest, barely honest at all about the true choices that we face. So yes, I agree with you. And I agree with you about um, Maggie's complex, but I was not advising David Cameron to do this. Indeed, quite the opposite. I said that we should fight to improve the EU from within, not fight to get a special deal for the UK, fight to make the whole Europe more productive, more competitive, more efficient, more focused on the things that the people of Europe really care about, rather than to carve out special deals for the UK. So, will we win? Well, my view is that the percentage chances of heaven, hell, and purgatory are the following. 40% chance of heaven, 10% chance of hell, and 50% chance of purgatory. So I don't think that we are the um, front runners, but we are no longer the back runners. We are closing in on the leader. If we get a people's vote, I would say the chances of winning it are very high, but no, I'm not complacent. I would say about 80%. And my 40% chance of heaven is, you could therefore say, is a product of about a 50% chance of getting a people's vote and then an 80% chance of winning it. The person who is most happy about Brexit, I would say, in the whole world, is probably Vladimir Putin. It's in his interest that Europe is divided, and Brexit is a big division of Europe. He would love the whole of Europe to completely collapse if he could. That would be his absolute dream. And possibly the first, second person in the world who's most happy was Trump, because if it hadn't been for Brexit, maybe, I mean, again, his victory over Clinton was so narrow, but he actually drew energy from the Brexit victory for his own campaign. And of course, we know that, well, we don't really know, but the former head of the FBI thinks that there was um, something going on between Putin and Trump. And it doesn't smell right to me. And America is a very, very important ally, and we must do everything we can to strengthen the transatlantic alliance. But we also need to be strong in Europe, and that means strong together. And the UK, if we can stop Brexit, and we can, to use the words of another American president, yes, we can. <laughs> Thank you. So a couple more questions at the back. Hello, thank you. Uh, my name is Lara Beauvais at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. I'm curious as to how you see uh, Jeremy Corbyn's role in this. Uh, in the past when he was 
on the Remain side, he gave the impression he was marching off to a funeral or something. So I'm wondering if you think he has changed, if it benefits him, uh, and actually at the end of the day, how important his, his role might actually be. Thank you. Well, his role is critical. We cannot get a people's vote unless Jeremy Corbyn, at the right moment in time, tells his MPs to vote for a people's vote. He will not agree to do that in the first instance. In the first instance, he will want to vote against the government's proposal, whether it's a deal or no deal. He will want to vote against either hell or against purgatory. But, at the, but he will then say, the route to heaven is to have a general election and to make me prime minister. So that will be what his next move will be. But he will not be able to get that. Look, everything I say has to have caveats. Everything needs, every sentence that I have uttered this evening needs the word probably in it somewhere. <laughs> but it seems to me very unlikely that he will get a general election. And at that moment in time, if the deal has been defeated or if hell has been defeated and he can't become prime minister through a general election, the only obvious solution will be a people's vote. He will not want it, but his party will want it and his young supporters on whom he relies for being the leader of his party are desperate for it. And at that moment, he will not be able to resist the pressure from the rest of his party. And there's another factor as well, which is although he is in his heart anti the EU, he has got other people around him who know that leaving the EU would be bad for our economy and therefore bad for the public finances. And if he ever became prime minister, he would not have the money for the program of public spending that he wants to engage in. And this is something that his, um, the shadow chancellor, that's the shadow finance minister, his finance, is basically his, the second most powerful person in the Labour Party, John McDonnell, has the same suspicion about the EU. They think it's a capitalist project. But he is beginning to realize that Brexit would completely damage any attempt he has to spend money on the National Health Service, on schools, on homes, on roads, on investment, <coughs> etc., etc. So I think they will be there, but they're not there yet. Thank you. Last question. I say one other thing. At the march on Saturday, Jeremy Corbyn, we invited him, but he couldn't be there. So I stood up and I said, because I said, I'm afraid Jeremy Corbyn can't be here today. But several people have come up to me and said, am I Jeremy Corbyn? <laughs> and so I'm going to make a speech to you instead. My name is Sam. Sorry, excuse me. My name is Sam Tetlow, as you can tell from my name and my accent. I'm a Brit. I live here in Madrid, so I'm a very interested party. You've spoken a lot about um, fighting with positive messages, the three Ps, which I'm fully behind. But, and this will obviously depend on whether there's a no deal or a deal. What do you think the, the yes or the no, depending on the question, the, sort of the, the, the pro-Brexit side will, will do, as in how will they fight the people's votes? It, I would hope or would, would imagine that they're not going to just try out the same arguments that they that they, they gave in back in 2016. And how do you think they'll react to having to, to fight against, a, effectively, a, another um, referendum? Well, as I said, I think we are, as a campaign, learning the lessons that negative campaigning is not enough. Now, I'm not against negative campaigning. If you are facing hell, it's worth pointing out that hell is really bad. But it's also important to say that heaven is really good. And it's also important to explain, because of course these are just words, 
that there are people in our country, even in the EU, there are a lot of people in our country who don't have a good deal. So we need to find a way of sharing the benefits better. Take London, you know, I mean, there are poor parts of London too, but there's a huge amount of wealth in London has been created over the last two, two, two decades. Um, but there are places like Hull and Wolverhampton and Birkenhead and Southampton and Felixstowe, which have been neglected for decades. And we need to have a message for these parts of the country. And I think we will, and we're working on it. Um, there's another reason to feel optimistic, which is that if it is a choice between purgatory and heaven. Now, of course, Boris Johnson was the big campaigner in 2016 for Brexit. But he hates purgatory. He detests it. He resigned from the government because he wanted a clean break. Now, of course, what I'm calling hell in his mind is heaven. But actually, in his mind, the order is flipped around. He would really like what I call hell. But he would prefer heaven to purgatory. And he has said that what Theresa May is trying to negotiate is far worse than staying in the EU. So you have to think what the contest would be. In the last referendum, they had the most powerful campaigner in the land. This time, he won't be on their side. He may be on nobody's side. If there is a people's vote, Theresa May will have to defend a purgatory that she doesn't even believe in because she voted to stay in in 2016. There will be a deal on the table which will have almost no friends. And one thing we know about Theresa May is that she may have lots and lots and lots of qualities, but she is not a good campaigner. Well, thank you so much. This was a very provocative uh, session. Thank you for sharing your optimism, your energy with all of us. And you know, we hope to you know, bring you back to Madrid um, to recap and, and to look to back. Celebrate. And, uh, celebrate. Have a big to party. To kill and to kill the fatted calf. <laughs> I want to eat it. We'll have cochinillo. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> Thank you all, and I hope you uh, will stay in touch. And I look forward to welcome you to our next uh, debate. Thank you.